Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks to Nahed and to the Institute for hosting me. It's an honor, a great honor, to be here today and to share my work with you. And I look forward to your comments. Um, as Pedro mentioned, this is part of a book project that um, I'm working on entitled Post-Socialist Poetics, which is looking very much at the many different ways in which Tanzanians experienced the shift out of a socialist model of economic and political structure into what it currently is, which is not really one thing that you can pin down. Um, and that's typical of most post-socialist societies. We find that they do not constitute a severe break from one institutional form to another, but that what follows is typically a melange, some sort of um, um, concombinant, recombinant um, elements from, from neoliberalism and and socialism. So uh, as Pedro mentioned, I've been trying to tackle the fact that studies about post-socialism very rarely and almost never include con um, case studies from Africa, uh, which, is a, which is an enormous oversight because at one point in time, there were at least 35 countries of the 54 countries in Africa that subscribed to one variant or other of socialism or Marxist-Leninism. Now, many of these were short-lived, but in some places like Tanzania, as we'll discuss today, uh, it has a very long experience, and some would even say that there are moments where we're not, one's not entirely sure that we've completely said goodbye to the socialist period in Tanzania right now. So, um, we'll look at issues of um, how the arts engage with politics, first off. And this is a contested question that's gone, that has um, been of interest to philosophers and theorists going back to ancient Greece, if not earlier. Um, Plato, Aristotle, uh, in their works, kept speaking about the power, the force, the dangers attached to poetry and theater, that these forms can bring down a state. In Plato's Republic, he's at great, he goes to great effort to explain why poetry must be severely monitored because poets are dangerous. Um, so many people from east, west, north, and south have debated the relationship between art and politics. Four positions only out of many, many that one could explore are up on the screen right now. That art ceases to be art once it's yoked in some way or fashion to politics. So if you think about art history and the Western, Western tradition, art for art's sake is the preeminent uh, form of thought, where once it's reviewed to be um, functional in any way, it then ceases to be art. Nadim Gordimer is a novelist, a fiction writer from South Africa, who has grappled with these issues because South Africa is a case where arts, especially music, um, but literature as well, were f seemingly deployed for the purpose of liberation from apartheid. And then the question came, what now? Now that apartheid is over, what do artists do? And she says um, politicized art produces platitudes, and that if there was an alignment at one point in time with her writing and the goals of, of the anti-apartheid struggle, that is only because she, her art is about seeking a higher state of humanity um, and, of course, the struggle was in keeping with that goal. But that once you try to yoke it, um, you end up with um, propaganda. Um, Mulo Kozi, whose a name we'll come back to, is one of the preeminent literary scholars from Tanzania who spent his life speaking about writing and researching uh, poetry especially. And he also is of the opinion that poets in the service of political powers tend to be like parrots. And he comes up with his own word of parroting um, for political art. A second position is that art brings the political and the non-political -political into relationship with each other and that they are necessary for pursuing positive change in the world. Hannah Arendt's work is part of this. For her, the non-political is the social. The social is more of the domestic. And this is not in the sphere of politics, where she held Athenian Greece up on a pedestal. And that was the ultimate in terms of what politics ought to be about, debating and trying to find 
modes of governance that lead for lead people into a greater sense of freedom and human equality. Um, J. Peter Eubin is of a similar opinion. There are those that argue that art serves like a mirror to society. There's a famous expression, um, art is not a mirror held up to society, but a hammer with which to change it. So these, these bring the third and the fourth point into conversation here, where should it remain at the level of mirroring, of showing society what the reality is, of reflecting upon society, or as in the fourth position, is art itself a mode of action, a weapon with which to change society? And you see some of the names attached to those. Jacques Rancière, uh, Gugu Ationgo, East African novelist, who we'll also speak about momentarily. And then for the more um, active variant, uh, Bertolt Brecht, Paulo Freire, among many others. So for the purposes of debating and looking at those positions and seeing what data from the ground, ethnography, and analysis of poetry and music from one site, East Africa, the site I know best, can tell us we're going to look at three moments in time of political instability. And we'll look at poetry and music from these periods and see how they enlighten us in terms of what people were experiencing at that time and how they were interpreting and perhaps even advancing certain political uh, agendas. So the first moment in time that we'll look at is Tanzania's transition out of colonialism into independence, which occurred in 1961. Um, but really, for various reasons I'll explore in a minute, it takes us into the early, to, uh, early 1960s. We'll also look at Kenya in the latter part of that decade, when having achieved independence in 1963, it started shifting into an authoritarian state in the late 1960s. And then the third moment in time is Tanzania's, trans Tanzania's transition away from socialism into capitalism and multi-party democracy, which happens in the late 18, 1980s, throughout the decade of the 90s and into the 2000s. So I don't know that I need to show you this, but for everyone's purposes, we're looking at Kenya and Tanzania, which are here in East Africa. So Mula Kozi, who's one of the names I mentioned earlier, a preeminent scholar of Swahili poetry, has said that Today, the popularity of Kiswahili poetry in both Kenya and Tanzania, Swahili is the national language of Tanzania and one of the national languages of Kenya. The popularity of Swahili poetry in these two states is an attested fact. One meets with poetry at public rallies, social and political festivals, religious services, Muslim, Christian, and traditionalist, and school syllabi and activities. Performed poetry, a genre called ngonjera, is now common throughout East Africa. In the mass media, radio, and TV, programs have regular poetry recitals, and newspapers carry poetry pages. There are more books on poetry and poetry collections being published every year. That was from their 1995 magisterial overview, in which they interviewed 200 poets from Kenya and Tanzania and Zanzibar um, on their arts. So for basic background, um, Tanzania, Zanzibar, and independence. Uh, Tanganyika was the former German colony of East Africa that subsequently became a mandated territory given to the British after World War I when Germany was um, dispossessed of its colonies. It obtained independence through peaceful protest and lobbying um, in December 1961. And the first president was this man, Julius Kambarage Nyerere. Zanzibar, which is an island off the shore of, of Tanzania, about 24 miles off the shore, um, obtained separately its independence in December 1963. It had been a British protectorate. The Sultan of Zanzibar, also um, formerly uh, in the decade and the century before, the Sultan of Oman, uh, Sultan Said Said, uh, left Oman in the 1830s and set up his sultanate on Zanzibar, where he could better control the slave trade and other uh, the Dao trade from which his wealth derived. 
Um, from the 1830s onward then, uh, Zanzibar was ruled by sultans um, of Omani heritage and a sultan was given the right to continue ruling an independent Zanzibar in December 1963. However, in January 1964, there was a violent revolution by some definitions, others call it an invasion. Um, there's a contested history about that moment. But nonetheless, it was a violent transition to independence and the People's Republic of Zanzibar and Pemba was led by this man, Abed Karume. So as you can tell by the name, People's Republic of Zanzibar and Pemba was a socialist state, avowedly so, with support from the Eastern Bloc. In April 1964, however, so only a few months of Zanzibari independence, uh, President Nyerere and Karume joined their two states into the United Republic of Tanzania, which is what it remains today. So going back to Tanganyika's independence, here's Nyerere being born aloft by people excited by the prospect of becoming independent. And he was demanding complete independence, not a partial, slow process as happened in Ghana, which is where the British had experimented with um, offering independence earlier. And as Milokozi uh, said already in the quote that I read to you, the newspapers f were full of poetry commenting on these transitions, commenting on the prospect of independence. Poetry had been part of Swahili newspapers ever since even the German period. So the very first Swahili language newspapers we know of are from the 1890s, typically missionary publications. But very early on, they included pages of poetry. Um, and it has continued ever since. And it's not a small amount. There are hundreds of poems that were produced almost every week. Um, at the height of poetry production, there were some 30 newspapers published in the Swahili language, each of which would have either a whole page or part of a page devoted to Swahili poetry. And these, these devoted sections have their own names. Mashairi Yenu Matamu, our sweet poetry. Bustani Yawashairi, the garden of poets. Washairi Waitu, our poets. Ukumbi wa Washairi, the stage for poetry. Um, and Tungo means pro productions or, or um, texts. So you see lots of, lots of this happening. In May 1963, so a few years after independence, or really a year and a half after independence, but before Zanzibar joined, um, we see this poem that was published in the newspaper called Moafrika. And it's called Nirere, Take the Steering Wheel. I won't read the Swahili, but it, um, the English translation is, citizens, dawn has come, we got our republic. It had not dawned because there was a big thief that was stalking us, presumably the colonial power. We endured a long night before achieving it today. Nyerere, take the steering wheel. We are behind you. The steering wheel is yours. The job is yours to lead us. You've received the turban, a sign of rulership. Ministers serve you. We follow your orders. You'll pass by mountains. There'll be many troubles for sure. But we are seated tight. Just try to avoid the rocks. And we are behind you. Um, Another form of poetry uh, is that which is sung. And so tarab, which is the kind of music that one of the forms of music Pedro mentioned that I have been trained in, uh, was performed very much um, in this same period. And one of the key groups to sing about the New Republic was Lucky Star Musical Club. This is them in a 1970 picture, um, but poetry performed to instrumental accompaniment, but in complete typical structure of four lines of poetry followed by a refrain. One of these uh, records that was released by Lucky Star had on one side a, a song called Tanu Yajenga Inchi. Tanu was the Tanganyika African National Union, the ruling party of Julius Nyerere. And it's the name of the song says it all. Tanu is, is building the nation. Um, on the flip side of it was a song, Viva Frelimo. So, Part of the socialist ethos of Tanzania was, and Tanganyika at this time, was to fight for the liberation of other still colonized states. And Mozambique being right to the south, Frelimo being the ruling party there, this was also part of what they sang. 
I did a quick survey of some of the songs that uh, Lucky Star had produced, and roughly 10% of all their songs were directly political. Um, we have here a different kind of music. Pedro also mentioned the genre dancey, which is rumba-infused music, popular music that one hears in clubs. And this is the group Atomic Jazz Band, and their song Tanzania Ya Jenga Inchi. Uh, no, sorry, Tanzania Yetu Inchi Ya Faraha. Our Tanzania is a country of happiness. I'll play you a bit of that one. If I can. <laughs> So you hear them saying, and our father, Nyerere, is indeed our hero who brought us independence. Tanzania is indeed a country of happiness. People everywhere in the world recognize this. Tanzania is a country of happiness. So poetry and music was very much in the service of singing the praises of the new state. And in fact, this was not, this was both an upswing from below, a wellspring of popular support, but there was some direction from the top. After all, many of these groups received state support and you don't bite the hand that feeds you. But um, more intentionally, Nyerere actually convened a meeting of all the poets, the top poets in the country, and asked for their help, especially when he embarked on the socialist agenda called Ujama, which means familyhood, that he introduced in 1967. And he, he asked for the help of poets specifically to help him spread the news of Ujama and to help breed in the general populace understandings of socialism and the understanding that socialism is linked in his philosophy anyway to traditional life ways where people work together on plots, uh, communal agriculture was not a foreign idea, um, and assisting the needy, very much part of traditional life ways. So he asked for their help and they not only put their pens to work, but they formed an association. So they institutionalized themselves. They had a group called Usanifu, Wakiswahili, um, na, na Mashairi Tanzania. So a group of poets whose purpose was to try to write poems in favor of nationalism and nation building and, and building a sense of belonging in a country created rather suddenly and composed of 120 some odd ethnic groups, each of which had a reason, had, had feelings of belonging at the subnational level. So that was a purposeful directive from on top, even as many of these poems were written by ordinary people across the spectrum. In fact, I think I've neglected to mention that in that one I read to you, Mwafrika, um, I forgot to put it up there, but um, each of these poems always includes the name of the author and then address. And although I can never tell age from this, this was written by somebody who was at Kikaro Middle School. So likely a student, it could have been a teacher, um, but the reason why I suspect it's a student is because the poetic construction um, is not as sophisticated as somebody who was um, of an older age group. So there's a repetition of rhymes that a more seasoned poet would try to avoid. So people from the entire country were engaging in writing poetry, and we see from the names, women composed, men composed, Muslims composed, Christians composed throughout the country. So that cannot be understood through just a top-down directive. Um, Kenya. We're going to take a look at Kenya now. And this, um, I'm, I'm going to focus here on especially the work of one poet named Abdelatif Abdallah. But in order to understand him, you have to understand that Kenya achieved its independence through a very protracted and violent struggle after um, something called the Mau Mau movement uh, went on for most of a decade and involved the killing of thousands of Kenyans. Um, rather few uh, British colonial subjects, and, but nevertheless, many people died. And others were put into concentration camps afterwards. And there are still cases in court today 
where the survivors of these um, camp experiences are, are seeking compensation and damages from the British government, which has finally accepted responsibility for this period in time. Kenya achieved its independence also in December 63, exactly when Zanzibar was achieving its independence. Jomo Kenyatta was the first president, and he ruled until his death in 1978. His rule was marked by diminishing democratic rights, increased repression of opposition and freedom of speech, um, and freedom of assembly. And this led um, a young man named Abdul Latif Abdallah, whose family had a long history, not only of being poets, but of being political activists. And he speaks in a video you'll see soon about this long lineage that he has of people in his family who first protested Portuguese colonialism back in the 1700s, and then British colonialism in the 1800s, and then um, the authoritarianism to come. So he took it upon himself to start circulating pamphlets to raise consciousness among ordinary Kenyans about the way things were going, and saying, we didn't fight for independence only to see our rights shrivel up in this context. His pamphlets were named Kenya Twendapi, Kenya, where are we headed? And they would be mimeographed at night, deposited at, at bus stops throughout the city of Mombasa, Kenya, where he was from, and picked up and read by people. And eventually someone leaked to the authorities who was behind it. And at the age of 22, he was arrested in 1968. The government, um, pressured all lawyers to avoid this case so nobody would agree to defend him. So he defended himself. And he was, abs he was actually so um, gifted in the act of oratory that he was able to have three of seven charges dropped against him. But he was, in the end, convicted of sedition and, and assigned to a three-year solitary confinement uh, prison term. He served from 69 to 72. So one of the people who's written about Abdul Latif and his work says that this is what Swahili poets are commonly seen as, particularly knowledgeable people with a duty to speak up on behalf of their community when needed and as a kind of moral conscience. Abdallah himself endorsed this view, considering the context of post-colonial politics. This is the sample of what the pamphlets look like, Kenya Twendapi, that he would issue. And when he was in prison, he was not allowed anything in the cell with him. Absolutely nothing. No reading materials, no, nothing to occupy his mind. That was part of the punishment, was to try to numb him with boredom. So he would have a blanket that he would be given every night to sleep on. In the morning, they would take the blanket away. And all he had was a bucket for bodily needs. Nevertheless, over the course of the the years that he was there, he had three prison wardens, each of whom had an eight-hour shift. And he speaks about how two of these wardens had hearts of stone, and there was no amount of talking to them that could bring them around to be compassionate or empathetic to him. But there was one prison guard with whom he still remains in touch today, who in the end befriended him and would sneak into the cell just the last little nubs of a pencil and with that and the two pieces of toilet paper he was assigned every day, he would compose poetry just to keep his mind active. And like I said, he came from a long family of poets. While in prison, therefore, he produced the 40 some odd poems that then became this book, Sauti Adiki, which means voice of agony. And over the course of the poems, you can see how he comes to terms, first belligerent, defiant, proud of having done what he did to even standing up for his convictions. Um, but then, you know, realizing the, the long-term impact of his imprisonment and wondering perhaps maybe would he have done things differently had he known what the outcome would be. He still says he would have done the same. Um, but these poems had to be smuggled out by that one prison guard, and they were collected and preserved by his family. The irony of ironies is that he got out of prison in 72 and in 1974, they launched the Jomo Kenyatta Prize for Literature. And the first recipient was Abdul Latif Abdallah. So here, you see him receiving the prize from none other than the man that imprisoned him, Jomo Kenyatta, 
And his act of protest was not to wear a suit and not to honor the occasion with that kind of open uh, show of respect to the man that had imprisoned him. By this point in time, he was in exile in Tanzania because as soon as he was released from prison, he went right back again to his political activism and word got to his family that were he to continue, the next time he would not ever be released from prison except in a four-cornered box. So he went into Tanzania where he became a professor of poetry and Swahili at the University of Dar es Salaam and stayed there for seven years um, at Nyerere's request. Nyerere, the president of Tanzania, knew Abdul Latif's work, invited him to Tanzania when they knew what trouble he was in in Kenya. And after seven years, the law required him to either take citizenship or to leave. And at that point, he was faced with a choice and he said, I cannot continue fighting for the rights of my people as a citizen of Kenya if I relinquish my citizenship. So instead, he went to England, worked for the voice of, um, uh, worked for the BBC Swahili service, and then ultimately became a professor of Swahili, both at University of London and later at University of Leipzig. One of the poems that he composed in Kenya in prison was Mamba, which means crocodile. And it's very easy to see who he's talking about in this poem. I too have words, I'll join those already speaking, I'll gild my verse so it pleases those who are reading. Untwist these words for their sense may be misleading. There's a croc gliding smugly down the river, a boastful sop who believes he's brave and clever. He loves to talk, tells the world he'll live forever. With fool's conceit, he strings himself along, sustains belief that he'll always be this strong, but self-deceit and pride can only last so long. He should know, someday he'll breathe his last. He too will go once his die's been cast. Time will show his power finally past. What lies ahead, none of us can comprehend. What fate has set, no show of fierceness can transcend. Don't forget, what has a start must have an end. That's a particularly beautiful translation by Meg Arenberg, who managed to get the translation into a rhyme scheme, if not perfectly in sync with the rhyme scheme in Swahili, which has rhyme both in the middle of the verse and at the end, but at least it gives you a sense of the poetic majesty of this poem. And it, it should be obvious he's talking about Kenyatta. This next poem is called Siwati, which means I will not let go or I will not relinquish it. And rather than my reading that to you, I will let Abdul Latif read it to you. Or rather, recite it to you. I can get it back up. Okay. So first, I'll, 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 I'll let him introduce himself to you in the beginning of this video, if I can get it full screen. My name is Abdel Latif Abdallah, and I was born in Mombasa, Kenya, in 1946. I became a political activist at, at the age of 19. So I became a member of the opposition party, the first opposition party in Kenya. So because of my political activism, um, in 1968, I was arrested. And I was taken to the court, and I was sentenced to three years in prison. So I went to prison when I was 22 years old for political activities. But that's where I wrote my second book in prison. It's a collection of poems, about 40 poems, um, by using toilet paper, because there was not allowed any reading or writing material. It was completely solitary confinement. My formal education... Now we'll, we'll listen to him perform or recite poem. Well, I don't need the book. It's, it's in here. Although it, was although it was written more than 40 years ago. It's called Siwati. Siwati nshishielo, Siwati. Kwani niwate? 
Siwati ni lilo hilo talishika kwa vyovyote. Siwati ni mimi nalo hapano au popote hadi kaburini sote mimi nalo tufukiwe. Siwati ngaadhibiwa adhabu kila mifano. Siwati ningaambiwa tapawa kila kinono. Siwati lilo sawa silibandui mkono hata ningaumwa meno mkono si ubandui. Siwati si ushindani mukasema na shindana. Siwati ifahamuni sababu ya waungwana. Siwati ndangu imani ni thaminio sana na kuiwata naona itakuwa ni muhali. Siwati nimeradhiwa kufikwa na kila mawi. Siwati ningaambiwa niaminio hayawi. Siwati kisha nikawa kama nzi hivyo si tamma na kariri siwi na Mungu nisaidia. Okay, so you hear him saying this is one of the earlier poems in the collection when he's still steadfast saying I will not abandon that which I hold dear. And as hopefully you heard from the Swahili um And this is composed not in standard Swahili, but in his dialect of, of Kim Vita. So even people who know Swahili will find this a very difficult poem to understand from the first hearing or from the first reading. But it's, a, it's, it's very beautifully structured, and um, I hope you, get, you got that from listening to it. Another man who ended up in the same exact prison as Abdul Latif Abdallah was Ngugi Wa Tiongo, one of the world's most famous East African authors and philosophers. Ngugi Wationgo was imprisoned for very similar reasons as Abdul Latif, but several years after Abdul Latif's release. And he tells us that when he was thrown in jail in the same Kamiti maximum security prison outside of Nairobi, Kenya, somebody pointed out to him the cell just down in the hall from where he was. He could just see it looking out the window from his door the door to his cell, the same cell where Abdul Latif had spent three years. And that gave him the courage to, to endure his confinement. He was only in jail for a year, but he also wrote uh, writings um, in prison and has a very famous and uh, abundant legacy of writings. Um, his, his book, Pen Points, Gun Points, and Dreams. Now, he's the author of many novels, but I'm going to explore with you some of the ideas that he presents here, which is a critical theory of the arts and the state in Africa. Pen points, gun points, and dreams. I think it tells you a bit of where he's, he's going with this, that writing can be a weapon, but more importantly for him, the artistic process is like a mirror lodged in the consciousness. It is a complex mirror, however, with an X-ray element. It reflects both the surface and the deeper nature of things. So rather than a mirror that simply shows you what's there, the point of the arts is also to reveal what's not easily visible, to analyze, to interpret, and that this is the, the role that poets and musicians and theater pr practitioners and visual artists are intended to perform with their work. So it goes beyond simply reflecting and speaking back um, to what exists, but to analyze how it came to be in that situation. So he identifies what he considers four aspects of art that are what threaten states. The first is the godlike aspect. If we think of God as the ultimate creator who brings into being things that did not exist previously, who conveys life and animation to the world. Then artists do that because they bring works into being that did not previously exist. And they give life to ideas um, that are not otherwise articulated. So in this respect, artists are like God. They are not God, but they are like God in creating and producing life of a kind. Now, if we look at the origins of some of our words that um, inflect this talk, poetry comes from the Greek poesis, which means to create. Drama comes from the Greek verb, verb dran, which means to act. 
So yes, you can say to act as though in a play, but to act is also an, a form of action. And so in these respects, poetry and drama, which were the two forms of art that most concerned and worried Plato and Aristotle, they are godlike in that they bring into being things that didn't exist previously. Secondly, he identifies what he considers to be the Socratic aspect of the arts, which is that they're constantly questioning, questioning the state of affairs, questioning why relations are as they are, questioning how situations came into being in the first place. Here's that going underneath the surface that Ngugi sets as one of the tasks of artists. So Socratic aspect, questioning. The third one he calls the Andersonian aspect. And here he's talking about Hans Christian Andersen, drawing from Western storytelling practices in order to theorize um, his understanding of art and politics. Here, the Andersen story that compels him is the one about the emperor's clothes. This is a story where an emperor decides one day to parade around with not a stitch of clothing on and, and asks, oh, isn't my outfit beautiful? And everyone psychophantically says, yes, yes, it's a beautiful outfit, yes, yes. And then a child walks into the room and says, why is he naked? So that truthfulness, that's the, what he calls the Andersonian aspect, mirroring, calling out what the reality is. And then the fourth one he calls the Munchian aspect, drawing from the famous Edward Munch painting of the voice, um, because he says that artists restore voice to those who don't have it. So here you see he's moving us out of the third idea of art as only reflecting and, and commenting on things into a more active uh, role for art because by restoring voice, by speaking on behalf of those who are unable uh, to speak is an act that is changing the social and political environment. So keep these in mind as we go into the next moment of political instability that we'll be discussing, which is where the focus of my book project is on, post-socialist Tanzania. So in 1985, Julius Kambarage Nyerere relinquished the presidency to this man, Ali Hassan Mwini, second president of Tanzania, also known by the, the popular nickname Mze Ruksa, which means Mr. Permission, Mr. Permissiveness, that he allowed anything and everything to happen. So whereas Nyerere had been trying to build this socialist country, trying to reduce reliance on um, external imports and try to build up a national base of agricultural production and also industry, much of which failed. Um, and that's why in 1985, Tanzania was in terrible economic straits. I should, I should revise that. That is not why. That is one contributing factor to why Tanzania was in difficult straits in the 1980s. Truth be told, virtually all countries in Africa in the 1980s early 1980s faced a similar economic crisis, whether they were socialist or capitalist or what have you. And that's due to a whole series of factors stemming from the oil crisis of the late 70s into early 80s, um, a series of droughts, the war with Idi Amin's Uganda that Tanzania paid for entirely unassisted by any other country. There was a lot of things that contributed to the poverty of Tanzania in the early and to mid 1980s. So since Nyerere re refused, refused, refused to accommodate IMF conditionalities, he would rather step down from the presidency and let somebody else sign that loan agreement, which President Mwini promptly did. And this meant acceding to a number of conditions, including introducing multi-party electoral politics, liberalizing the economic system, privatizing many of the state-owned assets, all of which comes under the label structural adjustment. In the immediate aftermath of this, corruption flourished. There were all manner of opportunities to sell off these uh, state-owned assets at, at a song um, and all kinds of ways in which the electoral system was manipulated by those in power. So this is remembered as a time of high corruption and also severe cutbacks in social services, declines in school enrollment because now you had to pay for school, whereas before it had been a social service provided by the government. 
Same too for healthcare access. So a lot of declining um, markers of basic health. One of the main groups that had been supported by the government throughout this period uh, is associated with the National Service Army. So there are different military arms in Tanzania, and this is the JKT, the Jeshi, Jeshi La Kujenga Taifa uh, Army, which is what students had to serve one to two years in before going off to university. But it's a people's army, and they do a lot of building projects of roads and other similar things around the country, and it was a way of giving service to your country. But the, as with most of the government entities, so at the height of the socialist period, every government owned, and even many of the private sectors, had their own in-house music, musical bands. So the National Insurance Corporation, the Tanzania Harbors Authority, the Tas Tanzania Railway Authority, all of these had their own musical groups, JKT Tarab, is one of the many groups that was within the Jeshi La Kujenga Taifa. One of the songs they sang and released in the early 90s, right after this change to a multi-party system, is called Nahoda, which means captain. Um, we'll hear it in a minute, but the English translation, at least for the first verses, there isn't anyone who doesn't know what I'm about to say. Vehicles for travel normally move forward. We hope that the captain will be in front to steer. Captains of boats, why do they sit in the back? So if you think of pilot, and then it goes through, pilots of airplanes sit in the front, drivers of cars and buses sit in the front. Why do captains sit in the back? The rest of the song goes on to say, Captain, we don't like you sitting at the back. We want you to be in front where we can see you and where you can lead us to our destination with our confidence in our, in our journey. So please come to the front where we can see you. Now, of course, this was meant um, with many layers of meaning. Um, and before I explain those, we will listen to the song, at least a bit of it. Tarab, poetry sung to musical accompaniment, and that is with the larger orchestra style that one finds, especially in Zanzibar. Um, and and the, hopefully the meaning, you can imagine already that captains, leaders, should be in the front. None of these backside dealings that we can't see, can't understand. We want you to be in front to lead us, not on our journey, but to lead our country in a good direction. We want to see you. We want to be confident in you. There's another layer of meaning to this song that comes out of the Swahili wedding context, because these songs are also sung very commonly at, at wedding celebrations. And there it has a very different meaning, uh, more related to the politics of the personal um, and to interpersonal relationships. And here, um, without going into too much detail, it's like we prefer the front, we don't like the back, we prefer the front, we don't like the back. Um, and here we're talking about sexual relationships and women sort of sending messages to their husbands who may or may not be listening in the room. So multiple layers of meaning in these songs, um, from the most overtly political to the most subversive. Another form of music that pops up only in the context of the shift out of socialism is rap music, because it was only after the trade tariffs and other um, 
protective measures to, uh, about the Tanzanian economy were lifted, that Swahili rap cassette, uh, that rap cassettes from outside and the techniques, the tools, the, the cassette players and turntables that were the producing agents for rap, the technological assets, entered the country in the late 1980s and the beginning or 1990s, at the same time as the shift out of socialism. Called Swahili rap, sometimes called bongo flava. Um, this is very popular up until the present. And what's interesting to me is that these rappers oftentimes were not alive during the period of Nyerere. They cannot remember that period of time, and yet their songs are infused with references to that period of time. I, I give you one example here. So I leave it with the floating TVs. But you see Tanzania, you see Nyerere floating throughout this song from start to end. This song was produced in 1992. And Nyerere died in 1991. Um, so, uh, or no, I'm sorry, he died in 1999. He was still alive, but he was very um, elderly at this point. And people are quoting him, citing him, sampling him, inserting him in their music, this young generation. And they are also using his words, not just the ones that he's articulating in the video, but their, their poetry, and it is poetry, is um, inflected with the things that he put as priorities. We must battle ignorance. We must battle disease. We must battle poverty. These were the three enemies of the state that Nyerere constantly talked about. And so you have that scene where they brought in photos from actually the Ethiopian famine. And they're like, you are eating so much, and others only wash their hands with nothing to eat. And he talk, they talk about health care, and they talk about um, poverty. So we have. Artists who are using the political sphere now, not only as fodder for their songs, but actually as venues. So here we have this other very popular uh, rapper right now, Professor J. And he takes his name, with his, his, his uh, real name is Joseph and Bellini. And he, in this uh, cassette cover, takes, turns his name into an acronym. J stands for Gifunze, teach yourself. O stands for Ona, C. Sema, speak. E for Elamika, and, and teach others. Um, Pitiya, P is the, is pass this around, and H is Hamasika, which means promote it, advance it. In other words, whatever he's using in his arts should be spread around and, and that it should be a means of 
self, self knowledge and about this general situation. So in his early songs, he pretended to be a, a politician in order that he might show the bad actions of politicians and the ways that they are not serving the people in ways that they would like. Ironically, so there he is as a young rapper in the 90s. Um, four years ago, he won uh, a parliamentary seat. And so now he is MP um, in Tanzania and people are waiting to see whether he can translate into action the things that he had advocated through his art. He has not, by the way, abandoned his art. He is a rapping MP. He still goes into studio and still releases new songs, gets criticized for that by the government because he represents the opposition party. And they said, how can he be doing his work for the people if he's busy uh, recording songs? To which he replies that his songs are again about educating people and trying to make them aware of the political state of the country. I want to uh, play another example, which is the one that the handout provides you with the full translated lyrics. This is a song called Tanzania by another rapper named Roma from 2007. And um, there are subtitles in there as well, but you can see how I've broken down for you the thematic subjects of this very long uh, rap song. We're not going to watch all of it. But the first section, if you look at the side on the left, he's speaking about Nyerere. In the very first line, 1961, Kambarage became a hero. So here he's not using the first name or the last name, but Nyerere's middle name, Kambarage, Julius Kambarage Nyerere. 1961 was independence. Without shedding blood, he made December shine, because December was the month that Tanzania got independence. Rest in peace, because by 2007 he is deceased. Maria is crying for you, Nyerere's wife. In soul you are with us, but in body you are lost already. You didn't want to stay long in power. You transferred it to Alhaj Mwini, President Mwini. Now they fight over the state house with raw lust. Words of their campaign is to get income to citizens, but, and then he goes on about bribery, ethnic conflict, religious problems as well. So. So we have uh, post nyerere politics being hearkened here in 2007, recalling back to mind 1961 and independence, bribery and corruption, false preachers. These are the new wave of prosperity gospel ministers that were never allowed in Tanzania up until the end of the socialism made anything and everything available. Bribery and corruption, theft, corruption and theft, and then murder is where he ends. So we'll watch a bit of this. I think it plays. Let me see. Kila kitu mkinjingiji Wema wafa mapema Wabaya mbona hamdani 
kabila Mofisini ndo swadata likuwa doktor wa mifugo Ndo vuka tibwa soka Menunuwa jeti wa pata sa shahada Elimu za kunga unga na digriza kikula Taluma iso mafshucha kwa tulio so masayansi Magorofa na odonoka kwa kufojwa kandabasi Na hasu na mwagajasha kwa hera ya mama ntilie Mami don't cry daddy futa chozi usilie Na real so crying na kono umepanda mori kamorano kimasai Hiro Tanzania Chenyo dongo nye dhambi Wanalisaka sana taji of shit Biblia na shikiria na kemea Wana gongo niyo falme na umakia Tanzania Wana karamu frisari Dini zetu wazifanyia mirari Tanzania Taifa liopotea Tanzania Wanaria kwa hadizeno Okay, I'll stop it there But you have the full song You can find it on YouTube It's available on YouTube You can follow along the lyrics But he's calling out all kinds of problems that he's identified in Tanzania while still asserting through use of the flag, um, through uh, calling back the valiant history of Tanzanian independence, asserting his position as a national loving subject of Tanzania, a citizen of Tanzania, proudly so. And he inserts this, this critique within the rural sector, talking to ordinary people. And in the, here we're now back in the city, but he's talking to ordinary people and engaging them in this conversation. So the, the idea of introducing knowledge, interpreting, helping people understand the situation, calling out the excesses and the problems in state um, is all evident in this poem. So some reflections. All these genres are popular genres composed and produced for everyday people. Karen Barber defines, a uh, famous anthropologist, defines popular culture as that which pertains to the common people as distinct from economic, political, and social elites. In these genres, all the ones I've discussed, the newspaper poetry, the tarab, the dancy, the, the rap, and similar genres across Africa, she writes, what we hear most often is collective affirmation. We keep hearing voices that evoke the presence of us, the poor, in contrast to them, the rich and powerful. We keep hearing expressions of sarcasm, outrage, and challenge. We also keep hearing the eloquent plaintive assertion that though inequality is a condition of life, the poor have dignity and moral worth and may one day escape their condition, that the power and powerful and, dis and advantaged have an obligation to assist the weak and the disadvantaged, and that individual self-realization can only take place through relatedness to other people. We see something similar coming out of the, this wide, encompassing study of history, uh, history of Swahili poetry, but also interviews. In Mulokozi and Sengo's 1995 study, they spoke, like I said, they interviewed over 200 poets. And they conclude that most key Swahili poets, 67.5% of those that they spoke to, belong to the working classes. Only 1.2% can be classified as upper class professional, i.e., managers. None belongs to the rich bourgeoisie. They also state that Kiswahili poets were not divorced from their societies, but were participants, mouthpieces, and commentators on the struggles of their people and their time. What remains now is to study their poems seriously so as to elicit their understanding and interpretation of the political process. So here we see Mulokozi again summing up that the job of these poets, their self-perceived role, is to identify analyze and comment on, uh, interpret the political situation that they find themselves in, and that this is going to change depending on where we are, what point in time we're at. So um, the, the, the research that I'm doing has to include the rap, because although the newspaper poetry is clearly evidenced from all across the country, people of every ethnic group, people of every religion, and every um, all gender affiliations, uh, I cannot, as I indicated, under, make sure that I'm capturing the youth voice. And Tanzania, like most African countries, the youth represents 60 to 65 percent of the population. So the only way that I can access that for sure is to engage with the rap scene, which is also poetry. Um, and if I had time, I would share with you the Swahili version of this poetry that you have in translation. But trust me that as in English rap, as in other rap forms around the world, Swahili rap is also a form of poetry. And that its job, its self-perceived role, 
is to articulate the grievances of the poor and the disadvantaged and to call out the extravagances and the, um, the misdeeds of the wealthy and the powerful. I'll leave it there and ask if there are any questions. Thank you.